Hello, this is Nathan Wood, pastor of North Dayton Baptist Church, and welcome to day 42 of the McShane Reading Plan. So glad you could be with us. It's a joy and a privilege to be able to um, open the Word of God with you. And, well, we are in Genesis 44, Mark 14, Job 10, and Romans 14. Job 10. Job is falling into despair further and further. He is not cursing God, but it's getting to the point where he's wishing that he had never existed, never been born. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very sad. And Jesus says that of one person in his midst at the Last Supper, and that's Judas Iscariot. And that's one of the reasons why, um, sadly, I, I tend to believe that there was no redemption uh, that Judas found. Not that he couldn't have, but I don't think that he did find uh, reconciliation or salvation prior to uh, dying at his own hand. Because it doesn't, it doesn't matter what terror you might experience in this life. It will be completely eclipsed by the greatness of of the eternity that is enjoyed by those who are found in Christ Jesus, who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, um, and are washed in his blood, and have trusted in his resurrection. The um, So to say that it would be better that somebody is not born, it, a, a blissful eternity would eclipse any bad thing that would have happened, including an up to demon possession, which this is more than demon possession. We find elsewhere in the Gospels that Judas was actually possessed by Satan himself. And um, the only way that I think Christ could say that it would be better if somebody had never been born is if they'd never existed so they wouldn't be guaranteed a place on the lake of fire. I could be wrong, I, um, but I really, I really don't think that that is wrong in this case. Um, but suffice it to say, in Mark 14, there's a lot of terror. There's a lot of beauty and a lot of terror um, and a lot of heartache, desperate heartache. After the Last Supper where Christ um, fulfills the Seder in bringing the communion to us, which the cup is indicative of the wedding, uh, the wedding covenant cup of the Galilean wedding. Um, and these Galilean disciples would have understood that. But he asks the disciples to pray, and Christ pours out his heart before the Father. And folks, don't ever be ashamed of being afraid. We've talked about that. We've talked about it this year. It's important that we suffer well. And Christ suffers well here. Perfectly. You say, well, how is it perfect? Well, it's not imperfect to let God know your fear. Notice that he lets God know his anguish and his fear while simultaneously praying for God's will to be done. So this is a heartbreaking, heartbreaking chapter of scripture. Seeing the lover of our soul, the um, of our souls individually, and the the precious, precious Son of God, Jesus Christ, just so broken, in anguish, struggling. He knows our pain. He knows our sorrow. Take comfort in that. Take comfort in that. And take comfort in the fact that he went through this for you. And, you know, the disciples are just over off to the side, sleeping away, sleeping away. And Jesus is merciful to them. Um, we need to be mindful of that when we um, when we see others um, 
what shall we say, lackadaisically or in, um, inadvertently fail us. Um, Jesus showed them mercy, and these men still became mighty men of God. And we've got a, another betrayal here, although this is more, well, it's a denial. Peter bitterly weeps after he denies Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the only difference between Peter and Judas, I mean, there are, are details that, you know, Peter didn't take money and whatnot, but the main difference between Peter and Judas is that Judas didn't repent, truly. He felt bad. He felt sorry for what he did. He regretted what he did, but it, it was not a heartbrokenness that Peter experienced. He did not, uh, he did not repent in the same way Peter did. Peter repented unto restoration. He, um, he didn't just regret for his own sake. He regret, he regretted for Christ's sake. Um, but in the middle of this, we have a very odd thing that happens in the gospels. Peter is the one who cuts off the, the servant's ear, Malchus. Um, it doesn't say it here, but Christ puts it back on. But imagine this young lad, which very well might have been one of the disciples that's not named, because obviously it's Peter that cuts off the ear, and he's not named as the one who does that. Um, so Mark doesn't bother. So it's probably one of the disciples who's clothed with uh, nothing but a linen um, cloak. And why is this here? Probably, well, I, I'd say it's there because Mark is telling us how terrifying the evening is. They grab a hold of him and he is so terrified of what's going on in the garden that he, this young man runs away without his clothes on. Doesn't care. He'd rather be found naked running through the city than to be caught by these people. Consider this. I mean, listen to the gravity of these words. Christ says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Um, watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. Listen to the gravity of these words. Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the sun of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. He that betrayeth me is at hand. But wait. Yes, Judas is betraying him. But the one who's really betraying him has already betrayed him before. When he rebelled in heaven and drew a third of the angels away. Yes, it's Satan himself that's walking at the head of this company of torches and swords and spears coming to take Jesus and whoever is with him. In other Gospels, it, it tells us that Christ speaks, I am, and it lays them down. He lets, he lets Satan and everybody know that he has complete control of the situation. But it's still a terrifying situation, still a terrifying scene. You imagine what this young man that ran away naked felt. You, you see torches and flame and shining spears and swords coming to take away your precious Lord. And you're groggy and sleepy. And you get up and you see a man with Satan in his eyes leading this company of soldiers. Of course you would be terrified out of your wits. Dark, dark night. One of the darkest nights of all human history. But Christ endured it for us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He endured it much like... <clears throat> I wonder if he was thinking about Joseph and how his brothers had betrayed him. And Joseph goes through with his... Um, with his test and he puts the cup and frames Benjamin on purpose and Judah at the end of this lays himself down fully at the mercy saying uh, of Joseph saying no Lord 
take me instead, Judah, the patriarch of the tribe of Judah, messed up Judah, who ended up siring a child with the widow of his son. Thinking she was a prostitute, he comes around to being willing to lay down his life for his brother Benjamin. That's the type of sacrificial attitude that you expect out of the kingly tribe that will be the family of Jesus Christ himself. Beautiful passage. And Romans 14. In light of all of this, it's happening. Christ pouring out his soul, readying him for self-sacrifice. Judah being uh, self-sacrificial. Joseph having been betrayed, wanting to have reconciliation and peace. Job being put through the ringer of true suffering. That... Jesus is going through in, in similar fashion, but so much greater, having the weight of the entire world of it on his shoulders to be our symp sympathetic high priest. All of this scripture is going on concerning redemption and suffering. And what does Romans 14 have for us? Paul has to address, I'm sorry, it's an important issue because we got to deal with it, but it's the stupid issue of what we eat and drink and people getting hung up over it and what days are holidays and what days are not folks look at this at the beginning for one believeth he may eat all things another who is weak eateth herbs if you impose dietary restrictions on yourself for personal convictions even if even and especially if they're for spiritual reasons good for you that's wonderful it's, it's right and good to fast, and perhaps that's a personal sacrifice. But understand that that being an act of worship does not put you above anyone else in regards to the Lord. Neither is it something that you need to impose upon others or look down your nose at somebody else. Um, and that includes kosher law. That includes kosher law. Um, same way with holidays. Let's face it, folks. Historically, Easter and Christmas, pagan holidays. Pagan holidays. Jesus was not born on just December the 25th. Sorry to burst anybody's bubble. That is Saturnalia. It's a pagan holiday. Guess what? God created the earth with a tilt, so that's when the sun is at the very bottom. The days are the shortest. But folks, isn't God the God of all days? So if we want to celebrate Jesus on a day that pagans want to celebrate something else, isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a good thing? Yes, absolutely it is. Um, and folks, you know, if you are convicted in your heart personally, to say, no, I don't, I don't want to take part in a secular tradition here because I don't want to... I don't want to glorify anything that is uh, satanic or anything like that. I, I really feel convicted about the pagan. That's fine. That's fine that you feel convicted. But don't think that because you feel convicted about that, that somebody else is under the same conviction. There, Paul is telling us here, that, and that, this goes for types of food, whether or not we drink alcohol, whether or not... Uh, we observe certain holidays or not. Lauren and I and Lydia, we started celebrating Hanukkah this year. Not because we feel like God demands it of us, but we wanted the blessing. And I, maybe that's a little selfish, but we wanted to experience what Christ experienced a little bit more. Celebrating the Feast of Dedication. Does that mean that I look down on people who don't celebrate Hanukkah? Absolutely not. I would love to celebrate Passover this year because I think that's richer than whatever Easter is, but that doesn't mean I won't celebrate uh, Easter, but that's Passover. 
the Resurrection Sunday. That's a more appropriate term. Um, we call it Palm Sunday. Why not call it the Triumphal Entry? You know, it's um, there's blessing to be found, I think, in observing the feasts of Israel, but to impose them upon others? Paul discourages it. Because generally speaking, when you start dealing with what people celebrate and don't celebrate and what people eat and drink and what they don't eat and drink, it leads to Phariseeism. Christ, remember, says it's not what goes in, but what comes out that defiles. Um, so need to be aware of that. And um, take account of yourself. If you feel convicted about something and you feel like you need to avoid something, or if you feel convicted and say, hey, I think that God is calling me to observe this. That's wonderful. Do what you feel the Spirit leading you to do. And I don't believe that the, that the Holy Spirit leading somebody to observe a feast and somebody not to observe a feast, for different reasons, God knows our heart and our motivations. I don't think that that's a cause for division. And Paul tells us it's not. Now, and, and in fact, if we, if we are mature Christians, we're not going to cast stones on people for arbitrary and light and transient reasons. Folks, I truly believe that one of the problems that the church has in modern day, where we are now, and the reason we are losing some of the moral battles that we are losing in the world is because we have fought the wrong battles in the past. I really believe that. I realize I, somebody might not agree with me, but I believe that part of the reason why we're losing the battle for morality on real hard issues that are core black and white issues in the scriptures is because we fought the battles over things that were really of no importance. Um, whether uh, whether bars or, or liquor stores can sell on Sunday. Folks, I'm sorry. Sunday's the first day of the week. Yes, it's the, it's the day of the week that Christ rose. I'm not trying to dishonor it, but it's not the Sabbath. And I'm not saying you need to observe the Sabbath. Ta Paul talks about it here. It's not about holy days. But folks, fighting a battle over whether somebody can buy a bottle of liquor on a Sunday or after 9 o'clock, that has nothing to do with anything scriptural. Now you can say, well, we're trying to make a wholesome environment. You want to make a wholesome environment? Teach somebody the word of God. Teach somebody about the salvation they can have in Christ. You don't make a wholesome neighborhood by keeping, keeping substance out of people's hands. You, you put good in. You put good in. And then... Then you see what happens with everything else. Now, we're not in a perfect world, but I think the gospel is more important and more potent and infinitely more powerful than any morality law that's imposed, especially when the scripture doesn't have anything explicitly to say about such matters. It discourages drunkenness, certainly. It also discourages gluttony. Sadly, I saw a picture that somebody had doctored this year, or I guess it was last year, of the Beatles, making them look uh, morbidly obese. And you know what the caption said? And, uh, you know, I'm guilty of eating too much myself. The caption said, this is what the Beatles would look like if they sang for the Lord. And you say, well, that's, that's just blasphemy. That's blasphemy. You're making fun of Jesus. No, folks, it's... The reason it's funny is because it's all too true. We've gone to bat over whether or not Christians drink beer and, well, we're at a point where, you know, we're known as the fat people who hate people. Um, we've fought the wrong battles. Paul tells us so. Verse 21, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby a brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. So yes, exercising your liberty to the point where you offend somebody else, 
who is we a weaker brother in their presence, don't do it. Don't do it. But look, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself and the thing which he alloweth. Again, you know, this is not saying, hey, alcohol is okay. I think that I'm going to go drink myself into a stupor. No. <laughs> hey, eating, eating non-kosher is okay. I'm going to go eat myself into oblivion. No. Hey, Christmas is okay. I'm just going to go all out commercialism. No, that's not what I'm saying. Hey, the Jewish feasts are good. I'm going to put myself under the law and condemn everybody who does it. No, no, that's the point. That's the point. It's not about moral relativism, but what he's talking about is like, if God has not explicitly condemned or enforced something, and I'm not talking about discouragement or encouragement, those abound. But if something isn't sin, or if not doing something isn't sin, then we shouldn't name it so. And we shouldn't be throwing stones at our brothers and sisters in Christ, or even unbelievers, for doing so or not doing so. That, you know, we in that way can really defend our credibility as believers. That way, when we say something, hey, the Bible says this is wrong, they don't say, oh, well, you, you all just hate everything. You just don't want me to have a good time. No, that's not the point. No, it's not about not having a good time. It's this is wrong, period. And we can look up chapter and verse. Um, verse 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Here is a hard, hard truth, ladies and gentlemen. If you try to impose a practice on yourself and you're not sure of it, if you're not wholehearted in it, you need to be careful. Look at, look at the last statement. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What does that mean, to the, especially to the Christian or the human existence? That means if we do anything in this life that is not in, to the glory of God, remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Paul is affirming this. For whatsoever is not of faith is of sin. So guess what? If you do something that doesn't worship God, it's sinful. I, I'm sorry. So that means whatever you do, you know, you say, well, I can't live like this. I can't live like this. This means that if I take a breath and I'm not thinking about Jesus, that I'm in sin. Guess what? That's why Christ died. Because we can't live good enough but having been born again, once you are born again and you have the understanding of what sin is, we press toward that mark. We're not going to be perfect, but we press toward sanctification, trying to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, asking God's help as we go along the journey, um, dying daily and, and really wanting to have a better relationship with him, to grow closer to our Lord. That way, you know, and we're supposed to examine our deeds and what we do, like drinking this coffee. If I don't drink this coffee as an overall act of worship to the Lord, I am sinning. Why? Because the Lord deserves my every thought and every deed. If I watch a movie, and you might think this is crazy, if I watch a movie and it's not to the glory of the Lord, I am sinning. But guess what? I can watch Star Wars with my brother tomorrow and it not be a sin. How? 
because if I'm, you know, wanting a good uh, time with my brother, or even if I watch Star Wars by myself, I can say, thank you, Lord, for this little escape of, of this interesting story with good music, and thank you, Lord, for creating something that can just, you know, kind of uh, give me some silly enjoyment for a little while. You can worship the Lord in the silly and in the entertaining. Um, it is possible. Now, if I get all into it to the point where it's taking first place in my heart, that, that becomes a problem. But you can glorify the Lord with so much. Um, let's look at here. Uh, my, my bookshelf here. Oh, yes. I have this magazine that came, uh, what would this have been? This is Ariel Magazine, Spring 2020. So this is about a year old. But it's talking about the Messiah in 2 Samuel 20 through 24. Well, right next to that, I have J.R.R. Tolkien's Letters to Father Christmas that he wrote as a good good fun exercise and this is his illustration for his children talking about santa claus okay and you know i'm not saying you should or shouldn't teach your children about santa claus but folks tolkien and he was a roman catholic and led c.s lewis to the lord who was not a roman catholic J.R.L. tolkien loved the lord wrote fantasy and fantasy, he said, is a, of course it's escapism. But it brought glory to the Lord. It brought glory to the Lord. It still does. High fantasy does that. The writings of Tolkien and Lewis. Folks, don't ever let anybody come down the pike and throw stones and play the Pharisee saying, well, that daggone little fantasy, all that stuff, man, that's out of the devil. Tolkien's not of the devil. It's not. Um, when we worship a way of doing things, or if we worship a prohibition, we're not worshiping the Lord. We're throwing up facsimiles of faith in order to make it look like we know the scriptures when we don't. Abstain in honor and glory to God. But don't do so to the honor and glory of yourself or to the disparagement of your brothers and sisters. Two of the giants of our day. You may agree with them and you may not, and they disagreed and agreed with each other in many respects, but they were best of friends. John MacArthur and the late great R.C. Sproul would sit at dinner together discussing anything and everything, godly things, mundane things, you name it. John MacArthur does not believe that you can be a Christian, a good Christian, and drink alcohol. And there sat R.C. Sproul with a glass of wine. Square that circle. John MacArthur knew better. He knew there were exceptions to his little rule. And I'd say that R.C. Sproul understood that not all these teetotalers don't are, are ignoramuses. Folks, we need to have grace to each other. And we need not to throw stones where it's not necessary. Because guess what the ultimate message is? Christ and him crucified. Him bearing our burden. Dying for us all. He didn't die so we could bicker about stupid crap. He died so we could be a united force to proclaim his name to the nations and build his kingdom. It's my prayer you're a part of that today. If not... Please join him. Please trust in him. We love you. Have a good day.